Hi, welcome to this conversation. I'm Frida Souza. Thank you for joining us. Um, everyone sort of sat up and took notice uh, when we read the news in our morning papers that China had decided to announce new names for 11 places that are within Indian territory, within Arunachal Pradesh. Now, this happened on the 4th of April. China said it has renamed 11 places in uh, Arunachal, our Arunachal Pradesh, which China calls South Tibet in a move to sort of further deepen the mistrust with New Delhi. Uh, now, this is not the, we must point out, it's not the first time it has happened. It's happened twice before. Once in December 2021, and where China released a list of 15 places that it had renamed. And again in 2017, when uh, they put out a list of six places that it, has, it had renamed as well. We're trying to find out with our guest this evening, what is the relevance of this particular action uh, that China has taken at this point, and what can we understand from it as citizens of India? Joining me right now Mr. is uh, Dr. Shrikant Kodapalli. He's the Dean of the School of International Studies, and he's Professor of China Studies at JNU. Dr. Kodapalli, thank you so much uh, for making the time to speak with me this evening. It's a pleasure to have this conversation with you, um, especially given that you are an expert on the matter. Uh, is is this uh, you know uh, new release by China a surprise to you, or is this something you've grown to expect in terms of uh, the you know the sort of regular overtures that China makes to assert its uh, claim on territory? Uh, well, the uh, it was not a surprise because, as you mentioned, this is the uh, third time, uh, two thousand seventeen and twenty one. Uh, they have come out with uh, name changes uh, and the the predictable response from the Indian side on those uh, aspects. Um, it is not a surprise also because the nationalism is rising in China and a lot of uh, voices have come forward. Uh, for example, Shen Chi Wei of the Global Times, um, uh, he argued that Vladivostok belongs to that of China. And uh, a day before President Xi Jinping's visit to Moscow uh, uh, last month, the Vladivostok has been renamed in Chinese uh, characters and uh, uh, also Khabarovsk in uh, Siberia. These names have been changed. Uh, and it was surprising that Putin did not protest the name changes that the Chinese have made, uh, possibly because of the Ukrainian conflict and the mm. imperatives of the geopolitical situation. Um, so that is, uh, and uh, Sohu.com, a Chinese website, uh, mentioned that uh, Kazakh uh, tribal leaders, clan leaders, pay tribute to the Middle Kingdom in China. Uh, and uh, that has enraged the Kazakh foreign minister who summoned uh, the Chinese ambassador to Astana uh, and uh, gave him a dressing down. So these things are happening uh, in terms of nationalism uh, rising in China and possibly other countries will have to face flak uh, in the near future. Uh, one Chinese nationalist also said Hawaii belongs to China. Uh, and. <laughs> So it means basically now we may have to see many name changes across the neighborhood of uh, China or even beyond, uh, like Hawaii. They changed the names of the South China Sea Islands into Chinese some time ago. And also they have uh, the Tiayutai for Senkaku Islands uh, with Japan. Uh, so it's uh, a um, all round kind of conflict not just India, but there are also other countries who uh, are now becoming victims of this name change. Uh, uh, so I, I guess it is uh, universal now in China on this. Uh, Dr. Kondapali, so would you say then for Indian citizens who are looking, who are suddenly worrying that is China making, um, you know, is China trying to annex our territory? Is this? Are you saying that the uh, the Chinese habit of renaming things is not something particularly to worry about? Because nobody in the world is also reacting to it at this point. Well, at another level, I would say it is worrying because um, uh, when China is stronger, China is coming up with these name changes. 
uh, when China was weaker, uh, it did not mention those things, uh, which mm. basically indicates a trend. Uh, tomorrow, if China becomes number one, it is already number two in economy. Uh, yes. And in comprehensive national strength perspective, it is number three now. Uh, and uh, if uh, China becomes number one, um, courtesy Henry Kissinger's policy, uh, and uh, everybody engaging with China. Uh, if China becomes number one, it will enforce these uh, at a later date. So China is preparing the groundwork right now when it is uh, second largest economy and probably it will impose its will uh, tomorrow if it becomes number one. Uh, it is uh, simply not possible for um, China to take away but that is a contest that is emerging. So this is technically called as legal warfare uh, in China. In 2004, they introduced this doctrine of three warfares, which includes legal warfare, media warfare, and psychological warfare. Uh, and so this legal warfare basically means that first you put up the names and gradually uh, convince everybody to acknowledge uh, for example, in the joint statements, China forced many countries, including Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and African countries to be uh, quite interestingly, because they have spent a lot of money in the BRI projects, yeah. Belt and Road Initiative projects. So they're compelling other countries to acknowledge the Chinese position on South China Sea, on Taiwan, on Tibet, on Inner Mongolia, on Xinjiang, and tomorrow, possibly on Arunachal Pradesh as southern Tibet. So that is how the Chinese would operate in future. Fai, are you on? Ira? I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. I got disconnected there. I'm just going to read out our uh, response from the MEA, Dr. Konopali, if, if I may. Um, our Ministry of External Affairs has said, and I quote, we reject this outright. Arunachal Pradesh is and has been and it will always be an integral part of an inalienable part of India. Attempts to assign invented names will not alter this reality, end quote. Now, there are some portions of the Indian media that have called this a strong response. Do you see this? Do you interpret this as a strong response from our government? Well, the strongest response would be changing the names in China by Indian names uh, as a, tit, uh, as a uh, counter to what China had done, uh, or um, uh, Manasarovar uh, or other areas uh, in Aksai Chin. For example, there is uh, even now the uh, uh, Kurnag Fort uh, and uh, Hazi Langar uh, in Aksai Chin. The Chinese have changed these names after they occupied Aksai Chin in 1954. Uh, and so possibly India could, you know, mention these names, uh, uh, Indian names to these places uh, or possibly in, um, you know, extended Arunachal Pradesh into Ningchi Prefecture. Uh, in Tibet currently and you know so that would be the strongest response. A stronger response uh, would be uh, you know a um, um, mobilization of forces and uh, uh, you know making every other country to recognize uh, Arunachal Pradesh as part of uh, India. Uh, 
like the U.S. Congress has passed the resolution uh, some time ago, uh, well, when uh, the State Department in 1962 uh, had mentioned about the McMahon line as the border between India and China. Yes. Uh, so likewise, um, taking, your, taking it up to the next level and uh, in the joint statements mentioning with other countries, uh, about this, uh, about Arunachal Pradesh as part of, uh, and Aksai Chin as part of India. Uh, so that would be a stronger response. A strong response is uh, like the statement that you have read out of the MEA, which is kind of bland, uh, which is, um, you know, um, a statement, a matter of the fact kind of statement. Uh, so possibly that doesn't ruffle the figures, uh, feathers in China. Mm. Uh, and uh, so I do not think it is strong enough. And, you know, yeah. we, we, India's presidency of the G20 is currently on. It's, um, you know, as, as we understand the citizens of this country by reading our papers and also looking at our airports and our roads right now, it's a really big deal. Is this an attempt by China to embarrass India while its uh, G20 year, its presidency is, is uh, ongoing? Uh, since uh, these have been mentioned in 2017 and 2021, uh, I do not think it is a, uh, an effort here uh, because they have also embarrassed uh, Russia on place names on Vladivostok or uh, Kazakhstan or others. Uh, but I think it is uh, a game plan um, at the uh, uh, imposing kind of uh, you know pressure on India when the territorial dispute has not been resolved since the Galwan incident and since the Indian line has been unless until peace and tranquility prevails on the border there will not be any bilateral you know relations as Dr. Jayashankar mm -hmm. mentioned on June 17th 2020 uh, two days after the uh, Galwan incident so from that point of view I think uh, this is uh, skirting the uh, the main um, line that India had taken and uh, putting pressure on India through these place name uh, changes, uh, number one. Number two, I think uh, the uh, when you mentioned G20, G20 is a multilateral um, you know, initiative uh, in the economic field uh, and uh, place name changes is at the bilateral level. So, India would be soft on that issue uh, to say that this is a bilateral issue while G20 is a multilateral issue. Uh, so in multilateralism, we don't bring in the bilateral uh, issues. Uh, you can discuss these in the sidelines as it mm -hmm. happened between Chin Kang and Dr. Jayashankar when the G20 foreign ministerial meeting took place uh, or when Dr. Manmohan Singh spoke about the the uh, Yalung Zampo uh, being uh, changed uh, in the uh, hydroelectricity project construction at the Durban meeting of the uh, BRICS um, way back uh, a decade ago. Uh, so you can bring in the bilateral, but in the sidelines of these meetings, uh, but not in the main meeting of the multilateral grouping that you could uh, bring in the bilateral yeah. issue. So uh, that bifurcation has been made uh, by more mature countries uh, oh. and uh, possibly uh, China is testing the waters at the moment uh, and, you know, trying to um, vitiate the atmosphere to an extent. I have a question. Uh, do, uh, yes, um, please. I'm sorry. I do see a long-term trend here. Um, in 2017, uh, when the place names have been changed, uh, President Xi Jinping wrote a letter to Yume sisters. Yume is a county um, closer to Ningchi prefecture, opposite to Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, so he, in this letter, he praised the, the those Yume, Dolkar and uh, someone else, uh, praising them for the border infrastructure and security work that they are doing. And uh, Xi Jinping visited Ningchi Prefecture later on uh, in 2021, July. And uh, the 14th five-year plan had announced uh, $23 billion of uh, uh, you know, infrastructure in Tibet, including in these uh, places where these name uh, 
you know, in uh, Sona County, which is roughly a part of Arunachal Pradesh, part of uh, Tibet right now. Uh, so they have uh, uh, changed the names closer to the um, the Sona County, and uh, a day before they also changed the um, Sona County into a Sona city. Uh, with the direct control of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. Uh, this is more significant than the name change because we would possibly see a railway line built up to this area uh, and possibly more military deployments from China uh, is in the offing. So that is the significance of this move of name yes. change. Uh, Dr. Konapali, we have a question from Kanchan um, who says, and I am quoting, he says, world class roads have been built on our side. Um, uh, she, she says that I've, I've been riding my motorcycle and our security forces are doing a great job. Uh, you know, in minus 40 degrees, we have uh, border infrastructure equal to China. But the fact that China is making these moves, it's, it's really important for citizens to understand because it's so muddled at this point. Because we are asking questions and we're taking note of what our neighbor is doing is not in any way a question mark on the strength or the loyalty or the good work of our border security forces. But as a country, as citizens, we have to constantly be vigilant and we have to constantly keep an eye on our neighbors. Is that not true? That's true. I think Kanchan's question is quite valid. And we made substantial progress in the border infrastructure. Uh, in 2020, October, we have uh, uh, constructed several strategic roads. That process is still continuing. It's quite arduous uh, because we neglected the borders for a long time after the 1962 border clashes with China. Uh, but we woke up uh, recently about a decade ago and we have, uh, we have been targeting about 64 strategic roads um, and BRO, Border Roads Organization and GREF, uh, they both are doing uh, yeoman work uh, in the connectivity uh, issues. Uh, and uh, not just the roads, but even the railway that has now been uh, extended or planned to be extended uh, from Assam to Arunachal Pradesh and uh, in um, uh, Jammu Kashmir uh, to Ladakh, uh, there is a line that is uh, to be shortly commissioned. Uh, and fiber optics, um, airfield construction changing from the ALGs advanced landing grounds to a full-fledged airport uh, that we are now doing and uh, other infrastructure projects as well. So I think we are doing, um, we now have um, uh, pulled up our socks and now, uh, you know, making our efforts in this infrastructure. Uh, but one thing I think here, we also should include uh, the locals uh, in terms of the small and medium enterprises and uh, the common folks uh, so that these projects do not become isolated projects but are useful to the local people. Tomorrow we may have good relations with China. Uh, uh, after all this uh, trouble is over, uh, um, but these roads would be, uh, and infrastructure, other projects would be of uh, no use if we only target for the border security. Uh, we need to also plan uh, to include the local chambers of commerce, to include the local NGOs, non-governmental organizations. We need to include the local communities, the villages, villagers uh, in these places uh, so that they become stakeholders in the uh, overall security of that region. Um Dr. Konapali, you did say that, you know, when this issue is resolved to, you know, to be fair, this issue dates back to 1914 during the Shimla Convention when that line was drawn uh, for our audience who don't know that history. Is Shimla Convention was held back in 1914 to be able to demarcate territories between India and Tibet mm -hmm. and China. And this line that, uh, you know, uh, that we're talking about specifically was agreed upon by Tibet and India because that was the border at that time. China then turned around and said, since Tibet is not, uh, you know, an independent entity, it has no right to make any sort of agreement. So China 
in, in retrospect, does not recognize that agreement at all. So that is the line between Arunachal Pradesh and Tibet, which now China sees as between China and South Tibet, which is what it is calling Arunachal Pradesh. Is there a possibility of a resolution at all? Because China just seems to be wanting to, like you said in the beginning, expand in all sides on Russia, towards Russia, towards the, towards the Pacific Ocean, and you know, in the South, uh, territories like Taiwan and India as well. Is there a possibility of a resolution? Because India, in, in you know, it's among all of those, India is a strong contender. India, sta in, in terms of size, um, it, it's we are to be taken note of in this in this region. Well, several scenarios uh, of whether we can resolve the territorial dispute uh, with China. Uh, one is um, uh, ultimately this has to be resolved one way, one way or the other. Uh, and uh, maybe tomorrow, maybe a hundred years later, maybe a thousand years later, we'll have to resolve this problem. Uh, uh, so that's one scenario. The second scenario is um, uh, if China breaks down, uh, Tibet becomes independent, you will have a new border with uh, Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, if uh, you know India becomes weaker, China asserts uh, its position and incorporates this area. So, I mean, quite a few number of possibilities uh, on that issue. But uh, I have no doubt that this has to be resolved uh, by uh, the leaders uh, and uh, the political system. Uh, Deng Xiaoping once used to say that uh, if this issue, territorial dispute with India is not resolved now, the next generation will resolve the problem. Uh, but the next generation has not so far arrived. So we are still waiting for this to be resolved. Uh, but I, I presume that um, since we accepted the Westphalian um, 1684 um, Westphalian Treaty of uh, fixing borders with latitude and longitude, so one time or the other, we may have to get back to this, even though they keep saying, both India and China keep saying they are civilized states, civilized, civilizational states. Uh, and so they um, go away from the Westphalian, but they do have fixed borders. And I presume that there will be some fixed border uh, in the near future. Uh, on the 1914 Shimla conference, Lonchan Shatra of the Tibetan side uh, Sir Henry McMahon of the British Indian Foreign Secretary and uh, Chen Fan of the Nationalist Government at that time in 1914. They met in Delhi and cobbled up the uh, McMahon line uh, and that was initialed by Chen Fan and signed by Lonchen Shatra and by, of course, the British Indian representative. Uh, which means if you sign, if you initial a document, it means that in principle we accept this, uh, but we will come back to this for fine tuning the details um, of the uh, of the uh, McMahon line. So in principle, China had accepted McMahon line. So when Chow En Lai, the former premier, came to Delhi in 1960. Uh, he told Nehru and he told Gobind Vallabh Pant uh, and others that uh, please don't call this McMahon line. Please call this as a people's line. We will accept this. Uh, secondly, he said uh, we will accept south of McMahon line is part of India. That is currently uh, Arunachal Pradesh, provided India accepts Aksai Chin as part of China. So we didn't uh, at that point at that moment Nehru did not accept the swap principle, mm. and so we are now back at the same level of the territorial dispute and the and the intensity. Uh, but the fact of the matter is the Chinese representative initialed the document, which means that it is frozen. Uh, you cannot now say you know somebody else had signed. We are now forming a new government. Uh, that is not acceptable under international law. Uh, so China willingly has to accept the McMahon line uh, in future as well. Otherwise, uh, any, any state can get away and say you are a rogue state. Yeah. You cannot accept the, uh, the provisions that your previous government had accepted. So it is, uh, it is uh, 
uh, a binding issue for China as well, uh, that they they probably could tweak it uh, a little bit here, a little bit there, but uh, in principle, they have accepted the McMahon line. Uh, Dr. Monabali, as, as someone who's watching, um, you know, our um, diplomacy and our external affairs so closely, um, and I know that this is multilateral and we're talking about the G20, but I just would like to seek your opinion. In your opinion, do you believe um, our stint at G20 uh, at, at the presidency has been successful so far? Because we've not been able to sort of get everybody to agree on a joint statement. There hasn't been even a combined photograph. There have been a lot of questions about uh, differences on the Ukraine war, on India's stand, on uh, you know, just generally agreeing on many of those things. What is your what is your opinion right now on how how well this has gone for India? Well, I think we did well um, given the problems that we inherited so far. Uh, but fundamentally, G20 is for economic issues. It is not for geopolitical issues. Geopolitical issues can be discussed in the Security Council, in the United Nations General Assembly, in the uh, Geneva-based Human Rights Council, uh, which they discussed about the Ukrainian issue. But Bali G20 meeting was hijacked with the Ukrainian crisis. Um, and uh, a statement was issued under duress uh, by the uh, Indonesian uh, host. Uh, and uh, that we inherited. The, the, uh, the whole baggage has been inherited in uh, the finance ministerial meeting in Mumbai, uh, as well as the foreign ministerial meeting in Delhi of the G20 process. So this is a geopolitical issue. It's not an economic issue. So um, to that extent, if we have not come out with a joint statement, it doesn't really, really mean we have not succeeded. Uh, but the most important thing is that uh, India packaged all this as part of the global south, uh, that mm. the Ukrainian conflict has an impact on the global south, and how do we wriggle out of it? Uh, for example, the global south suffered from the Ukrainian conflict in food crisis, which is a fundamental problem uh, because uh, Ukraine and Russia are considered to be the food basket um, by exporting a lot of wheat uh, across the world. Uh, and so there is a huge problem. Also, the sunflower oil, uh, cooking oil, uh, which is a um, massive amount comes from Ukraine because of the weather conditions and the soil fertility, etc. Uh, and so this food crisis has resulted in a lot of problems for the global south. Secondly, energy crisis. Um, when the the Ukrainian conflict began, the oil prices have gone up from almost zero dollars per barrel during the uh, COVID times, 2020. Uh, and then by 2022, uh, 2023, February 24th, it has gone up to nearly $140 per barrel for almost zero to that of $140. We are now currently around 80, 83 um, uh, dollars per barrel. Uh, which means that the global south has to factor this fluctuation from almost zero to $140 per barrel, and now about 80 odd dollars. Uh, so your budgets are tumbling down and putting a lot of pressure on your transportation network, your manufacturing sector, your livelihood, uh, and this is a major crisis for the global south. Thirdly, fertilizer in Global South is suffering because uh, Global South is mainly agriculture based uh, and fertilizers uh, again are shipped from Sevastopol, uh, which is also part of the conflict uh, between Ukraine and Russia uh, with the kind of shootings and uh, the violence that we have witnessed in the past one year. So these three crises have affected the Global South and India had um, packaged the whole thing into the impact of Ukraine on economic issues of the global south. So I think it's a uh, it's a good way of wriggling out of the situation uh, because the G20 is mainly for economic issues, financial issues. Yes. 
how the FDI flows can be regulated, how macroeconomic issues can be addressed, especially the fallout of the global financial crisis uh, or the energy fluctuations. So those are the main uh, agendas of G20. Traditionally, for the past several decades, that was the focus of the G20, uh, not about the geopolitical conflict. We have had Iraq war, we have had uh, Afghanistan war, we have had uh, you know, um, various other conflicts, but they never became part of the G20 uh, processes. Uh, but now, because the globe is divided on the Ukrainian conflict, so that spilled over as part of the G20 agenda, which is uh, in the Bali summit. So That's India okay. basically integrated this process. All right. Uh, Professor, uh, thank you so much for joining us and, and helping us understand this better. I hope we can have more conversations uh, on perhaps more pleasant matters uh, rather than uh, China renaming 11 or uh, you know 11 places within Arunachal Pradesh. But uh, this, like I pointed out to our audience, is an issue that dates back to 1914. And so it's, it's not, uh, you know, it, is, it, it doesn't mean that India is doing a bad job at managing our borders or that we're not able to uh, you know militarily defend our borders it just means that china is becoming assertive and we have to keep a close eye on what china is doing as it does affect uh, you know the politics of the neighborhood uh, thank you so much for watching and for joining us do share this video with other people you feel might find it useful leave us a note if there's anything else you'd like us to bring an expert in on and talk about or are questions you'd like to have answered uh, do remember to like share and subscribe thank you for watching